Larry's Cannon, the Civil War reenactment cannon that wouldn't blow up. In August of 2001, Larry Orr invited me to his house on West Center Street in Ivins, Utah. That's when it was on the very outskirts of town to take pictures of he and his Civil War reenactment cannon. He looked sharp in his uniform and with the cannon and flag. He and his brother had been doing war reenactments and shoots for a number of years for schools, scouts, at this is the place, Memorial Village, celebrations and the like. At the schools, the cannons would be loaded with flour and make quite a show, but shoot nothing. On Friday, June, June 19, 2009, the dog woke me as Larry came to invite me to come with camera or video camera to Three Mile to see the shooting of his cannon for the scouts. The following day, the 20th, I drove away from my house at 8.31 and arrived at the gravel pit at Three Mile nine minutes later for Larry's cannon firing. The cannon, an 1861 mountain howitzer replica, like the southern states used during the Civil War. Larry and his cannon were there, of course, and a friend of his with a wife and daughter, Mark Potter and two boys, Bruce Gubler and a son, Kirk Best, Bob Best, Don Best, and Tim Best were there. Most of the Best had been in the ar Army Artillery and the National Guard. I took photos. Used in F-11 exposure. Later on the second roll of film, I went to F-22 when the sun came out from behind the clouds. I provided the paper for the packing and part of a can of black powder for the charges that provided three charges. The powder was put into Ziploc baggies, one per firing, with lead balls made of lead-filled aluminum cans. There were two misfires, many good fires. The firing was a noisy affair. Then the cannon was loaded back under the trailer, and that was the end of the event. The next firing was set for Saturday, July 4, 2009. We'd start Independence Day off with a bang. This time I left at 8.10 for my short drive to Three Mile. Scott McDonald was the cannoneer for the day. Three men helped him and Larry Orr supervised. Others in attendance besides myself were D. Hunt, his son Tyler, and one of Tyler's sons, a John with his son Madison and daughter Holly, 12 people in all. I only had my still life camera and shot using F11, F16, F22 on 200 ASA film. Larry made a comment that if we had a video camera, he would shoot one of the gravel trucks and it would surely be a hit video. Then he explained, on a more serious note, that many cannons during the Civil War would explode, killing the cannon crew. But this cannon had been forged in Missouri in a foundry so as to withstand explosions. He also explained the side-firing device that was used, but he had forgotten to bring his that day or else he would stand by the cannon by the side of it and fire it. Scott was loading the powder and I thought he was putting an excessive amount in. The cannonball was added, uh, the aluminum can with weight in it. We'd seen this done many times on other occasions and Larry had done this for years. Went fine. Then the next time after loading it, the powder and the ball Larry added a projectile, a sharp pointed stick this had been done in the Civil War battles, too. We all stood back, and I was behind a bush on the west side of it with my still camera to get photos because on the east side of the bush there was a nest of fire ants, and I didn't want to get stung. Scott lit the fuse, and uh, we all got back. Bam! The cannon exploded, and hundreds of pieces which flew in all directions, both wagon wheels, were splintered into toothpicks. One of the splinters hit my pant leg. Had I been on the east side of that bush I just showed you, a large, sharp piece would have hit me doing harm. D. Hunt was sitting in a folding chair by the side of the road under a chaparral bush, near his son Tyler's van. The round end piece of the cannon, weighing 30 pounds, whizzed past his head and lodged itself in the side of the van, entering the driver's side taillight and traveling halfway up the side toward the front of the van. You can see where it's positioned and where the end of the can cannon would have been, and you can see where it went right up to that van and went right inside. No one else had come close to being hit, but the van took the brunt of it all. And here's that 30-pound piece of metal at the end of the cannon. Well, 
No one had come close to being hit. Some said it was a miracle. I got some photos, and we tried to pick up the pieces and put them back on the trailer, all that we could find. We never did find the projectile. Of course, no video camera was captured of the event, but we were all safe, though shaken, and that ended our Fourth of July Day celebrations for the day. Larry bemoaned the fact that the video camera wasn't on hand, but had one been there, I feel certain that someone would have been hurt because of where the video cameraman would have been to film it. In my blog later that day, I wrote, This AM, I was a small cannon firing. On the third shot, the cannon blew up. Incredibly, no one was hurt, as metal and wood splinters flew in all directions. Tire Hunt's car stopped the back of the cannon. Well, our guardian angels kept us all safe. It wasn't our time to die. And aren't we blessed that we don't have wars raging here at home? Even today, several years later, a man asked me after church, blowing up any more cannons? No, I was just a bystander to the cannon that wouldn't blow up.